Hi there, this is a conversation between me and my friend Anduin who runs Roll D5. We just recently played a one shot on her Twitch channel, Roll R O L E underscore uh, D5, and we are releasing it on this channel, uncut, and I did a remaster of the sound design to be a little bit more cinematic. If you haven't checked that out, please go watch it. I'll link it down below and at the end of this video. Otherwise, this conversation is for you to get to know them and get to know our friendship and kind of listen to us nerd out about making D&D content. All right, have a wonderful rest of your day and I hope you enjoy. So what did you think about the game? Okay, but yeah, we play a new system every single week with a completely new cast. It's a lot. Yeah, why do why do I spend time editing? Why? Why do you why do you edit? Is it is I it don't. even worth watching? <laughs> I'm just kidding. How you doing? So good. How Tired you been? all the time. Tired all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like got off work, came over here. Honestly, I'd much rather do stuff like this mm -hmm. than my corporate job. So Ed. much. You know, corporate job pays for the arts. It does. It really does. That's how I keep World Five afloat with random charges. <laughs> it's through my job. <laughs> uh, speaking of Roll D Five, Anduin. Uh, what is Roll D Five? Well, let me give you the lore. So, Roll D Five is a Twitch channel that specifically specializes in playing indie TTRPGs. So basically showing people that there's more than 5e out there. You know, let us show you. And it started two and a half years ago when I was doing a podcast with Mika, who is my like right hand. We created the channel together. We decided to leave our podcast like thing because we wanted to be kind of more independent. Mm -hmm. to start a live stream and there were five of us that initially were there there's there's just two of us left now but um we came up with the name roll because we thought it would be cool for like rolling dice it's r-o-l-l -L. what about roll for role playing mm. and then we did d5 because there were originally five people uh, um, yeah so that's where it comes from roll d5 and uh i ended up getting our d5 tattooed on my arm Oh, there it is. Yep. With Mika on our year anniversary, something like that. Um, but we were playing, like, just random games, uh, like, mostly mostly 5e and then uh, an Arium system, where it's like you create your own world. And then okay. the OGL license shit went down. Oh, the good times. And it was, it was a good time. And Mika was like, you know what? This is our time to officially just move over and just do the indie TTRPGs. And I was like, bruh, that is, that is perfect. And so we did, we put out a statement that was like, hey, we are 90% of the time going to only play indie games. We will occasionally play some 5e, but it's usually supplements that are like by the community that we can integrate into it. Um, but yeah, we play a new system Every single week with a completely new cast. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. I mean, to be fair with the, the OGL, I mean, I think the biggest thing that the OGL taught everyone was uh, security in your own creative ideas. Yeah. Nothing's going to stop wizards. They're the big fish of all fishes. Yep. And um, cool. But I feel like between the OGL, Wizards firing a thousand people before Christmas, my prediction is they're going to do it again. Yeah. Because you fire before Christmas, you hire after Christmas, so that way when the market closes, it looks like yep. you made profit. Exactly. Um, so on, if it happens, it's proof that it's just even more so not a sustainable business model. Yeah. Um, but with that happening, and then, uh, not necessarily the drama of 2024, yeah. but just the, the transition to it, I didn't really care that much. Um, 
in some of the games that have yet to be released. Uh, we got super crunched down in 5e at high level play, and I just I got burnt out as a DM. Yeah. Well, mostly I would say I would have not been burnt out if I wasn't recording and editing. That's a that's a very good point. That's probably why we haven't hit a whole bunch of burnouts because we're doing so many different things. When you edit your own stuff too. That's oh, a lot. Oh my god. You're criticizing every single choice and yeah. Oh, it just stacks on top. Um which is why I, I mostly moved personally over to Shadow Dark. Mm-hmm. It's just a rules light 5e. Yeah. So we get the chaos of 5e. We can homebrew it whatever way we want. But it's just less likely to get stuck in the muck. It's true. Well, there's moments that we had. We got stuck in muck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so if you enjoy the muck, it's there. It's there, and you'll be <laughs> fine. <laughs> um... So you roll five. Mm-hmm. It's just you and two other people now. So technically we're a team of ten, but it's... Oh my goodness. I know. So there's me and Mika. We've moved our names from direct to, to director from creators because huh? we're like, the people that are on our team have helped create the channel what it is today. So what does creator even mean at that point? So sure. we moved to like director... So it's me and Mika who are directors, and then we've got two admins, who is uh, Shadow Sylvia and Julie, and then I'm gonna pull up a list so I make sure I don't forget anybody, because that would be embarrassing if I did. Um, But we've got Aetherius, who is our casual adventurer. We've got Andrew, and we've got GM Justin, they are both uh, narrative designers. That means they mostly GM on the channel. Mm. Um, and then we've got Natalie and Nat, who are techs, artists, and uh, Nat runs our TikTok. Sick. And then, I know, right? Somebody to do it for us. And then we've got Danielle, who is our design lead. So if you see stuff from, like, our games here in October, you'll see a really cool layout that's on all of our October games, which is Roll D5, but it's Roll D scared, but the S is a five instead. Oh, funny. Yeah, and so we're starting to do like theme months. So what Danielle does is he's a designer. He does all sorts of art and layouts for us and helps like be like our main designer for all the thematics on the channel. And then Zoe, who created our logos, <laughs> Man, I should just release weekly. Mm-hmm. Why do Why do I spend time editing? Why Why do you Why do you edit? Is it Is I it don't. even worth watching? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, because I like winning festivals. <laughs> I hear Ali just laughing. I don't even I don't even win. I get nominated. <laughs> hey, we we are also we were crit award nominated. We didn't win. But we got nominated. Nominated is all you need. Nominated is all we need. Um, yeah, the, I'm impressed with a lot of my friends who are able to grow so quickly. And uh, the two, there's probably three, but the two major factors I often see are um, building a team. So people have different responsibilities and they all have a shared goal um, within the design of the project. Uh, and then second, con- like, not just consistency, but frequency. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're trying to edit a movie or four movies out of a single episode or a single session, frequency is not a thing you're going to do. No, because you never know what's going to happen with all of those because the editing is just going to be different almost every time, especially with how much you do with like even like sound and music and like those types of effects they are going to be different every single time. And so you have to think about where exactly is this going to go and at what time and how long, like there's so many minute details in editing. So you kind of have to pick your battles as to which one you want. Uh, so as someone who does all of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Just so impressive. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. You say impressive, but then I look at the timeline 
and I only can spend 30 minutes a day on it. <laughs> you know what? And it's 10 minutes per minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. when I did podcast editing, I still do some on the side for a friend, but like, yeah, those minutes, man, they take forever. But it's so rewarding to look at the playback. It really is when like, it's done. Like, there's a done. punch in. There's not Ugh. a distraction. We get the joke. It was intentional. Yeah. It's, it's so <sighs> rewarding. It's like it sucks in the like in the moment when you're doing it. You're like, I just want this to be done. Then you finish and release it, and you're like, Yeah. So good. So why don't you edit? You know, that's actually what we're going to start doing here soon is we are looking into starting editing, but only because because we upload our stuff like our VODs, but there's the five to seven minutes of the before scene screen. <laughs> then yeah. there's the 10 to 15 minutes of intro break and then intro and then the ending. Yeah. And so we're. I was talking to my team the other day and I was like, guys, I think we need to start doing just some minor editing because this is yeah. a lot of just fluff in there. Cut so, the head, cut the tail. Yeah. Uh, in fact, shoot an intro. Yeah. And then shoot an outro. And then you're then So you you're you're pro you quickly introduce it in seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So fade we're out looking some into music doing that. And then fade Ugh. back in and you're good. Yeah. And we've got great music. We got a theme song like a theme orchestral music that plays every time on like our starting soon screen and our ending. So mm -hmm. we got like custom music done by a uh, dungeon maestro who's fantastic. Aiden is spectacular. It is shocking how little custom music is used in this genre. Yes. It is so it shocks crazy. Me. I hear the same epidemic royalty free music Constantly. everywhere. And, and that's why we also use um, uh, we use arcane anthems as well for like okay. our like like the live screen music and then our break music, which is a bunch of his like D and D parody music, so you can just like dance Fun. during like the break. Um, but yeah, it's like trying to do different music every single time because it's boring to hear the same things over and over again. Yeah, I mean. I'm working with a composer right now, Ivan. I can never pronounce his last name, so I'm not going to risk butchering it. Uh, Ivan, if you see this, just call me and t tell me how to say it one more time. I swear. Send a voice memo that you can Send a just voice memo. get every time. Uh, we've been spending the last month and a half making motifs for every era in Aww. the world of Aeda so that the world has a voice. That's uh, beautiful. And we're about to finish up the wild, and we're going to move into ambient tracks Ooh, based the off tracks. the motifs. Oh, so that way, so if you guys go into a, a dungeon from the Age of Thunder made by the giants, it sounds like that era. If you go into a dungeon made by the dragons, it sounds like their dungeon. Um... And that way, players and audience, you know, it's the stories right there and the sound as well. Yeah, the sound is so important for like, because it's it's a really big aspect of immersion. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to be able to have all of that, especially because you can also change like the tone of it as to what you're doing, what kind of emotions do you want to invoke, especially with like, um, when you're doing like battle sequences, you can pick out that specific oh, music that... to make it even more intense. Battle and it battle... enhances role play. When okay, yes. So uncut, yes, a hundred percent. Editing. Oh, battles are evil. They're the <laughs> most editing that I do is in the combat. Really? Oh my I gosh. I look forward to the end of combat. It's it's almost influenced my DMing where I try to avoid combat. <laughs> I avoid combat for completely different reasons. I don't want to. It just edit. stresses me out. Uh, so it's like because uh, many times I find myself the perfectionist comes out of like okay it's the monster's turn. Well I need to play the monster sound effect. 
Uh, mm-hmm. The monster hits. Well, I need to make the monster sound. Uh, you hit with a sword. Okay, so I need a, a slashing sound. Uh, you hit with a hammer. Well, I need a bludgeting sound. Arrow. That's a good point. Um, it does a lot. And then also rolling dice. I just cut rolls now. I just tell me the number. Yeah. There's been some <laughs> DMs too, especially like in the live stream space who are like, um, like before it's your turn, make your rolls. So then when it gets to your turn, tell me the results. So then we can just move on, especially when it's in like a VTT, then there's the records right there for you to look at. So then when it's your turn, you've got the result, the action, and then we move on to the next person. Yeah, uh, that does speed it up. I think the speeding up of combat Speeding up of combat is a big thing, but I feel like the emphasis is the, the we need to care more about the roles, mm-hmm. and then we're not going to be throwing roles away, Spe- even in live play. Fun. It's like, what do I do? What do you do? I attack with my spell. Cool, bro. It's like, well, then you need to describe your spell. Like, put a little flourish into well, it. Well, I often I haven't implemented it because it's hard. To direct players more than actors. Yeah. And uh, one of the ideas I had is to stop thinking of your turn as a turn and more of uh, a three act scene that you get to run. So the first act, because all players do this, yeah. is in their head, quietly, alone, mm-hmm. in the dark. They're looking at the game like a chess board. Yep. What do I do? What do I need to do? What's, what's this? Well, if I can't do that, it's like, okay, the first act of your turn, say all of that out loud from the perspective yes. of your character. Yes. I want to go help the priest, but the problem is the fighter is blocking the door from the zombies from coming in, and I don't know which one to pick. Say oh! it out loud. Oh, yes, you've just made something something dramatic, something interesting. You've yes. Made, oh, and then you, you go, well, what do you think? You should do. Well, if the zombies get in, we're all fucked. So I'm going to go stop the uh, zombies and help at the door. Great. Roll a, a strength check. Yeah. All right. And stop. That's your turn. You, the second act is so making better. the choice and rolling for it. And then the third act is the GM describing the result. Yeah. And it makes that makes it so much better because it's because instead of just like uh, I'm going to shoot all the zombies at the door mm-hmm. cool but now you've got this whole like scenario situation that just like added to the world building and probably influenced like something about your character and how you're going to play them in the future yeah I like, mean it's so cool I'm all for describing how you swing the sword I'm all for describing how do you how does this spell look right there's a lot of creativity that that comes in there but i care less about that i care more about the the context the setup yeah it makes a difference of a a scene that a lot of action's happening and you really don't care or a scene that that is happening and you just don't want the characters to be in this room right now (laughs) yep (laughs) uh it's the context yeah. Um, and yeah, just describe your thinking process right now. It's actually, I find it interesting when players are in a meta way, solving puzzles and problems, trying to think through the encounter. Yeah. Uh, I was running a, a game at a cafe, the same game that we ran, <laughs> completely different. Oh my gosh. But the encounter, this is a great tra- transition. The, the encounter that you had in the fortress in the dining room. Ooh. Right? Yeah. You were fighting the, the vampire and the woman was uh, shackled to the ground. Yeah. Or the table. Um, because of time restraints and some bad choices of setup for me that uh, I couldn't have the vampire in that room. Ooh. I had to reveal that she was at the the one that's on the table was the vampire that moment. 
but she's shackled. So what I did is I had shadows come into the room and they fought shadows. Ooh, interesting. Um, and then once they defeated the shadows, uh, she revealed that she was a vampire and she tried to fly away. Hilarious op- bit there too. Uh, so they're trying to fight the shadows and it comes to this player who has never played D&D before. Played other mm-hmm. games, which is never D&D. Yeah. And he's, he stops and starts thinking about the scenario, the room, the, the fact that there are blue flamed lights around. Um, and that I happened to describe when they tried to attack a shadow, the sparks. I, I was mm-hmm. just being flarative. The yeah. sparks lit up the shadow and then the shadow came back. And so he was like, I grab, yeah, as describing the context of the shadows, the light, what he's seen, he's just putting it together. Yeah. Some DMs would say, stop metagaming, just make a choice, right? Yeah. This is the beautiful thing, putting it all together. And he finds a solution for this encounter that I will forever have. Uh, He turns and grabs the blue flame torch and strikes the shadow on the ground. Ooh. Um, so context in the world of Aeda, the blue flame refers to the umbral, the underworld. Uh, that is where all the undead monsters come from. So when he stabbed it, I just quickly, because I knew my world. Yeah. I said, the shadow gets sucked up into the flame and the flame goes out. The monster's gone. There's three more shadows in the room. Next player goes, I'm going to do that. (laughs) Yeah. And they all go start trying to pull, uh, put out the, the shadows. I'm so <laughs> proud of them. <laughs> the last one, the wizard failed. Uh, but then there was, they're literally in darkness because there's now they're yeah. out of light. And so I just described how the shadows just going up and down their backs and moving around. Oh, that's so cool. Ugh. I love that. Yeah. I love that so much. I was like, oh, this is a great solution. I love it. Yeah. But the fact that you stop to just think out loud. Yeah. Which then, uh, as a DM, I paid attention to what he's doing. And I tried to make sure no one was just, like, going to interrupt him or anything. Yeah. Um, he, was go- he was trying to put together the blue flame and the shadows. Yeah. And I had him roll an intelligence check just to see if... I could give him the solution there, putting those two together. Um, and he didn't roll enough. And then he quickly was like, oh, so I don't know anything about how what I'm thinking. I was like, no, 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 no. That was for something completely a bonus. What you're thinking is great. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Encouraging them to have to like, that's, that's where the whole thing for rule of cool kind of comes into play. It's like, okay, you have an idea. Let's see what happens. Like, Mm -hmm. don't let what you're thinking and, like, the rules or, like, an intelligence check, you know, something like that. That can just be some extra detail, some other flair. But letting them try to do something is way better than being like, ah, sorry, you don't know anything about anything. Try again later. It's, like, kind of lame. Yeah. The, The wizard at the end, she was the only one who made it throughout the whole dungeon. Everyone else had to swap out characters. Yeah. Um, I know the feeling. <laughs> uh, at the end, the dex check to get back over the bridge. She didn't make it, but she casted Featherfall and landed alone at the bottom, and we ended the game there. <laughs> oh. I would have just been screaming, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. We keep going. It's a great ending. So what did you think about the game? Okay. So, uh, when I go into playing games, so for me, the most intimidating part is typically character creation. Mm -hmm. So I see all of these people with like classic 5e, they're like, I've got a backlog of like five, 10, 15, 20 characters that are like super cool. And like, there's there's something to talk about there, but keep going. Do it. And, and I sit there thinking when I'm invited to a 5e game, I literally just create my character right then and there. Mm -hmm. because it's so intimidating so when on like on like rule d5 when we have like especially like um one pagers those one pager rpgs they say okay roll these things 
and this is what builds your character. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that is fascinating because not only do I have to not worry about the stress and mechanics of building a complicated character, Mm -hmm. this thing is doing it for me and I can build my character's personality and other things around that instead of kind of like the other way around. So when it came to Shadow Dark, I was so excited that basically everything was roles, especially Mm -hmm. for like, like, yeah, we could pick like what kind of race and other things that they were and their name, you know, the classic things. But then we did the role for strength, dex, con, and all these other things too. In order. In order. And making your character that way was fascinating because... Like, uh, like for like talents and stuff, you don't have to come up with that yourself. Let the character build itself alongside you instead of you just building the character. Mm-hmm. So I was fascinated by that and I loved that. Did that we have a level up in the game? <laughs> no, uh, let's oh. see, how many died? I think everybody, but like- Three, three. made it. Yeah, Nibs, Prim, and Rose. Nibs. Came Technically, back. he died. Yeah, so he's more like resurrected ish. I don't. I still don't know if Nibs was actually like my Nibs. Or that was your Nibs. Was... Okay, that makes me feel better because I was thinking about it the other day, and I was like, That's, "That was part of the red herring." I was like, is, <laughs> "Like the whole game." I was like, "Is this?" Is this my Nibs, or is this like some sort of bad guy and illusion? So I didn't trust him at all until I was he, able to like control his like abilities. And I was like, okay, I feel like a little better about this. <laughs> a my, little. The, the way I see it in my head, he luckily caught on to the like the wall. Like yeah. he's a marionette, yeah, made of stone. Uh, so he's he's easily as old as the fortress itself, right? Um. I was like, okay, he probably grabbed onto the wall and found a way in, which is a great thing to discover if you go into a certain part of the dungeon. And I imagine him, like, like fixing himself this entire time. He's, like, chiseling (laughs) himself to make it all, like, smooth out. He's missing a joint, uh, like, ball, so he's, like, picking a rock and trying to fit it in there it all while awesome. hearing like zombie noises in the back he's like god <laughs> please don't find me <laughs> he's just like, i'm made of stone so <laughs> come find me bitch so funny i love how like the difference between those two perspectives are because like i love when players get that kind of anxiety mm-hmm. that is some of the best parts of doing that i but, like yeah Oh my gosh, I I hate the anxiety as a player. Uh, but depending on the DM and like the not the premise, but like the the social contract of this specific game, yeah. Like if we are playing a zero sum game, like this is fighting monsters, we will die. We could die, right? Yeah. Uh, the stress is that fun competitive stress. Mm-hmm. If it is a not zero sum game and we're doing more of a story focused thing, especially when we're recording, um, yeah. the stress gets a little bit weirder because you're like you're performing weird. at the same you're time. You're performing because so you're like you're pausing and you're going, "What do I do at this point? Like, what's what's a good choice, not just a right choice?" Um, and that stress just becomes a different type of stress because you're not, yeah. And it's, it's kind of uncomfortable sometimes because you're like, I, uh, I don't know what to do. Which is so funny because I'm kind of the opposite because the first time I played a TTRPG, which was, of course, 5e, was on a live stream. The first time I ever played. And it was on purpose because I was going to be helping anybody that came in curious about the game to see what it's also like from a new player perspective. So any of the questions I was gonna ask, mm. other people would be curious about too. And I was like, I'm totally down for that. And so we kind of adopted that with World D5 because we, uh, this is a slight tangent, but um, we tell people, look over the game docs, but you don't have to be like super knowledgeable about all of it because mm when we start playing the game, the questions you're going to ask are the same things other people are probably going to be wondering. So when they watch the VOD or the live stream, 
they're gonna get their questions answered. Um, so, uh, I would say I've maybe in the past seven years I've been playing, um, I've maybe played four games in person and like two or three, like less than five games that are not streamed or recorded for content. So I don't know how it feels. The feeling of that other stress because I'm constantly performing. Sure. And so that's how I've adjusted is just working with that kind of stress. I the games that I played off camera um before DMing or DMing on camera. Yeah. That's... Um those games The difference is uh, you are jumping in on a server thinking you're playing a, a one a PvE game oh. uh, and you're just one-on-one -on -one, when really, no, this is a, a group activity. This is, a, this is game night. Interesting. Uh, that's what it's supposed to be. And yeah. uh, when you're not recording everyone brings the baggage of the week to the table That's it's true. very it's super easy to happen um and the worst thing is if you're playing like every week right mm -hmm. this is when you meet up with your friends you don't yeah. meet up any other time so like this is any stress at the table becomes actual yeah. friendship stress oh. um yeah, it's when you play not on camera and you just play for the group, I think mm -hmm. I think that's where more live streams and uh, uncut D&D &D games or tabletop mm -hmm. games have an opportunity to explore of breaking the critical role we're on stage yes. facade and actually acting like we're oh, we're we're just playing a game and streaming. Yeah. We're, you know, <laughs> we're just it's, chilling. Yeah, it's not like yeah, and that's a really good point too because people always equate themselves to critical role or even not so much dimension 20 because they do have that friendship aspect in that way a little bit more. They show it more. They show it more exactly whereas critical role shows more of the performance professionalism kind of side. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes like it is like not not just my channel but other people's really special is because we're creating friendships along the way. So right when we say kind of like, oh, the game, you know, we've we finished the game, everybody kind of you can you can see in their faces and their demeanor going from their character to, themselves their yeah. transition to themselves so then once the game is over we're like all right you know how's everybody doing everybody doing great and everybody's like becoming friends during the stream too because not everybody's played with each other before yeah and so when we're finished you know doing the stream everybody's kind of talked about themselves kind of like being a little bit more loose and not having as much anxiety because the stream's over then the game ends too and the call ends or not the call, the live stream ends. And then everybody is sitting there becoming friends and talking with each other even more. Yeah. And that is so special to be able to have that. Oh, and yeah. to be able to see other people doing that is really nice. It's so great. I love uh, that. And you're also facilitating it. Yes. Which you, is You run wild. the playground. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm the director. Um... Which, which was a lot in the beginning, like, because you needed to have different players pretty much every week. A lot of the times it would be me and Mika, like, constantly, to, but we try... To promote the thing that you're trying to promote, yeah. Yes, and so we, like, for any of our games, because there's so many, there's so many amazingly talented people out there that we started to have such a big group of people to 
ask to be in the games that we're like we should probably you know expand our horizons a bit more instead of having more or less the same people on over and over which is also really great to have that people want to keep coming back yes but we ended up creating a form that was like okay here are the games coming up for this next month or even the month after mm -hmm. people would go in and fill out you know their interests you know other things in the form we'd get it we'd schedule it out and we'd still have this huge backlog of people that we couldn't even get to and we're like well you get first dibs on the next one mm -hmm. so it's really nice going from mainly just me going out there and finding people and making those connections to now people ask to be on the channel Hell and yeah. that was huge so being able to facilitate that into what it is now alongside my team it has been so rewarding it's been fantastic. I'm so, I am shocked at the amount of growth we've had in two years. I did not expect any of it at all, <laughs> at all. You deserve it. Oh, compliments. <laughs> His. Have you seen Inside Out too? No, but I know. Okay, I, need I won't talk to. about it. <laughs> um, what you're talking, what you're expressing with the compliment thing. Uh, it is a universal experience, and it's not just it's you. It's so true. I love giving compliments to people, but if like they give them to me, I'm like. <laughs> I have learned to uh, mask the receiving of a compliment. Yes. It and it's not it's not false. Yeah. But I have to mask. I have to essentially pretend that I am performing thank you yes. to be comfortable uh. thanking for a com compliment. And in the act of doing that, I am actually thanking you. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> that is, that is such a good point. So I do that too. Sometimes I'm not wearing my mask like just now, but like, that is so true. Oh, man. Being human is hard. <laughs> it is. Uh, oh, I want to talk. I was going to say, you had a point that you wanted to go back to about creating characters. Oh, yes. So, um, I believe all of us are to some way creative. Mm -hmm. I am not religious, but I'm going to bring up the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I philosophically love the idea that the Genesis, uh, may, we may, uh, God made Adam in his image. Mm -hmm. At that point in Genesis, God has done nothing but create. So therefore, the only image that we could imagine Sorry. of him is creative. Huh. And so we are made to create. Philosophically, I love it. I just uh, learned more about you know, God in the past, you know, 30 <laughs> seconds than I ever did in my 21 years of Mormonism. <laughs> hey, you know what? Uh, everyone's got their own timeline. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I wish I had left sooner, but you know. Uh, but that's a, that's a really good point. So when it comes to players, this is both a bane and a boon when it comes to online create, uh, not online creators, uh, digital character creators. Yeah. Especially D and D with all its options, um, is people to get to become a DM. You're either forced into it because no one wants a DM, yeah, or you're a player long enough that you become a DM. Just yes. like in The Dark Knight, <laughs> if you don't die the hero, you'll, you'll live long enough to become the DM. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, and. Uh, that was my path. And when you're just a creator, you, or if you're just a player, especially a normal person who isn't brought up or pursues uh, creative arts actively, mm -hmm. when you're introduced to character creation, it is like being introduced to painting for the first time. Yeah. Um, even though it's paint by number, it's still painting. I constantly paint by number. <laughs> uh, Allie and I just got uh, a couple's kit to paint by number, so we're going to do that on a date night. That is so. That is <laughs> such a good idea. I 
love that. <laughs> Such a good idea. Uh, and I, I find that players, 5e players specifically, because that's my experience, is they love making more and more characters because it's just a form of creation. And I saw it even more so explode with Baldur's Gate 3. Oh my, my gosh. My build, the idea, uh, its it comes from the World of Warcraft uh, experience. It's like, this is the character I built. This is my expression. And uh, Baldur's Gate 3 is like, if you have these souls-like experience of D&D creation. I'm putting like some things together like about my childhood now because like growing up Mormon and in that specific household Mm -hmm. they did not like video games and so it was when I left and like was on my own or even after I left the church that's when I started to get really into video games Mm. and even as especially because now you're bringing up Baldur's Gate, I'm connecting to that since then and going up to creating stuff in Baldur's Gate or like I play a lot of Destiny 2 or Oh, the humans, character like, organization in Destiny is, is stupid. So, it's, it's so much. wild. And so I always follow a guide because it's really great to, to know like your creativity. Everybody is creative in so many different ways. My creativity is just not within character creation or like builds because I I would much rather follow somebody else's guide to tell me how to do it. My creativity is on a different side and that's wonderful to see how many different points of creativity especially in a collaborative role-playing story game comes together. I will say, I think um, there are two hiccups in there. First, when it comes to 5e or whatever, like build yeah. a character in Skyrim, build a character yeah. in 5e, Boulder's Gate, you're building to the limitations that you have and to the context you have. So if you are a DM who built their world and you're just plugging 5e in there, right? Yeah. You need to provide the context of what are these classes and what are these spells and abilities mean in your world. Because that will guide that character build. That's so true. I'm not going to build an extra planar character if there's no planes in your setting. Yeah. Um, That's true. The other thing is, when you said everyone has their different types of creativity. Mm Mm-hmm. Currently, I would disagree. Okay. I think people enter creativity through their what they have available as a set of skills and experience. Okay. So, if I grew up carpentry, my per, my entrance into creativity will be through carpentry, cabinetry, and eventually architecture, possibly. Yeah. Um but it's all coming from the same fountain that we all have. Yeah. And though it sounds like it's different creativity through the path of Okay. uh con- uh working with wood, you can get to working with metal or painting because you built a frame for a painting or you yeah. get into laser uh cutting for wood and then you're wondering what if I did this and then you would just explore and you just become that maker part okay. of your brain. Okay. I can get uh, behind that for sure. Another great example is myself. <laughs> I love that. Uh, getting into crafting has unlocked the ability to think three-dimensionally for me. More so. Versus sketching it down. You know, give me some material and I'll build a prototype. Oh, it's so different when you can work with your hands. Completely different. Uh, or... With world building, I actually care about uh, world history more now because I connect certain cultures to the uh, to my world, like yeah. ancient Rome being elves, uh, Mayan and Aztec being dragons, right? And so I learn about those cultures. Yeah. And I'm, my brain is, that maker part of my brain is the gateway of learning now. Um, and I just think everyone has that fountain that is their maker, their creative part, yeah. and they just get in there 
differently. And so if you work in tech and you uh, play D&D, you're going to think of it differently than someone who's coming from a theater background. But you're all showing up at yeah. the same place, the same table. The, oh, that right there just, like, fits so well. Because, like, especially, like, you know, somebody coming from that programmer mindset probably really enjoys the more uh, combat section. With whereas the combos the, that you can build with multi Yes. And whereas the theater kid is probably, like, role play emotions mm -hmm. but then being able to sit at the same table together to collaborate you learn from each other therefore expanding your own fountain getting closer of to the core of yes. that fountain yes which oh. will unlock more streams of creativity yes oh that is so cool i'm gonna think about that for the rest of my life <laughs> good and while you think about that, tell yes. me what you think was the most challenging thing in that one shot. Ooh. And there are different types of challenging. Yeah. Um, from a performance standpoint, it was keeping track of personalities for each character. Mm -hmm. Because we had seven it's the most characters I've ever played at once. Aside from being like a dungeon master where, you know, you have to be like 40,000 yeah. NPCs. Um, some of some of them just like reverse clone, and they just become yeah. one person. And you're like, yeah, yeah, you're just dealing with one person now. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's like the classic, you know, uh, the one that uh, Run DMG Ryan uses is Boblin the Goblin. This is like everybody <laughs> just eventually turns into into that NPC that shows up all the time. Um, uh, to be honest from a more technical standpoint of Shadow Dark itself, Ooh. I didn't I didn't encounter anything that I felt was particularly challenging because everything was so well laid out. What does your, you know, what does your wisdom do, your decks, uh, how your weapons work? It was a little bit of a relief when you come to do like uh, like spell casters mm -hmm. and you go in to do a spell, oh, usually your spell slot is gone and you have to wait until a long rest. Here it's like you succeed until you fail. Once mm -hmm. you fail, that's when you kind of you know, need to do that rest. I thought that was a really big relief um, and I didn't find anything particularly challenging in a way that was frustrating at all. Mm. because it all felt very um, explanatory. Any questions I had was very easy to find in the book and fix what I needed to. Um, I would play this again in a heartbeat because I enjoyed it so much. Those are the things that the game won awards for. So good. Ex exactly. <laughs> they are doing... They are, the awards are justified. They, it, it is wonderful. And I play a lot of games and this <laughs> one is very very good i loved it and it helps to have a really good storyteller oh you're great <laughs> <laughs> compliments um so i gotta stop and think think so you played multiple characters in um, in Shadow Dark's core rules. It's kind of the gauntlet experience. Yeah. You you grab five characters, all level zero normally, and see who makes it to the end. Going in, understanding that it was a spooky s game. You didn't. I necessarily didn't say it was Ravenloft up front, yeah. just in case you were familiar with like Curse of Strahd or something. I know the name of Curse of Strahd. I've never actually played it. That's okay. What were some of the backstories that you had Ooh. started putting together in your head for all these characters? Because you started like going, oh, this feels like a Nibs. Or yeah. this feels like, I don't remember their names anymore. I do. Prim, <laughs> Rose, and then we've got the dead ones, Jasper, Aja, and Hilda. Oh man, Hilda made it so far. I was so impressed. That's sweet, sweet dwarf. Um, okay, so we'll start with the ones that had died. Yeah. So for Hilda, we started kind of rolling, putting things together. 
figuring out the ancestry. Um, and I kind of wanted to more or less experiment with like ones that I've probably not really played a race in that uh, like situation before or at all. Um, she was a, a roustabout, right? Yeah. For those who don't know, roustabouts are optional character classes if you don't roll your stats high enough. Yeah. And they're, they have great advantages built in. They do. Uh, they're a great class. But narratively, they're designed to be the person who doesn't belong there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, they basically are an NPC. <laughs> That's a really good way to put it, because it's so <laughs> true. Um, and so, if, if people can't tell by my name, I really like Lord of the Rings. Um, so, of course, I was going to kind of gravitate towards a dwarf. And the red dwarf seemed absolutely awesome, especially with, like, the gemmed eyes. Mm -hmm. um, so my idea for her was um, basically it was kind of the same as Jasper um, that they stumbled into adventuring by accident mm -hmm. or out of necessity because I think for Hilda it wouldn't have been more like a necessity it would have been more by like accident mm. um, probably being like like because of the ancestry um they're generous and stalwart. I feel like she probably did something um, like an accidental escort mission and then just continued to do like little adventures. So she just happened to find her way to this terrifying, you know, vampire's lair. And then Jasper would was also a rust about and probably for him would have done it out of desperation, kind of like a tragic backstory of some sure. kind that everybody has. Um, most but he's overlooked has. because but he's, he's the roustabout. But he's overlooked, and he made it rather far too. I was so impressed. The poorest people in a capitalist yes. society can make it far. They really can. <laughs> they really can. Um, and I had the highest hopes for Aja. Um, Aja the the draconic, the black dragonborn, basically. Yeah. 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 Like I, I basically formed him after my black cat. Cute. <laughs> because I, I love my boy. Where is he? Normally he fell he's down sleeping a bridge. behind me. He, oh <laughs> my gosh. Um, PTSD. Um, to where he, he's just like this really sweet, kind, honorable person. Um, and I just, I just like, this just sounds really cool. I can't wait to do stuff with him. He dies within, you know, what was it? The first 15 minutes? Yeah. Or like probably the more like five. First challenge. Yeah. And he's, he was, was a, really a ranger and he failed a dex check and he died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that part. The irony of that is so good. The irony is so good. Um, and then we had Rose who was an Elkin, who's basically an half elf. Um, I have, I, I rotate through different like personalities or types of characters that I play on live streams because mm -hmm. sometimes they're last minute. So I need to have something there ready and prepared. Character. Your go-to So I Everyone's have kind of got, like a- Everybody's got a character wardrobe. Everybody does. I mean, I've got like a box of wigs over here, you know, like a literal <laughs> wardrobe too. Um, and I have two that I kind of go with. One is kind of like, um, as I didn't realize it at first until somebody pointed it out, but a discount jester from like Critical Role. So mm -hmm. like that type of like voice and action was kind of one of my defaults. One, one of the first voices I learned to do was a Russian Slavic kind of accent. Um, That's a good one. But I learned it because Baba Yaga. Yes. And I, and I was like, yeah, Baba Yaga, I wanted to, like, get that hag voice. Yeah. Um, but then it just has evolved into Gru. <laughs> you know, it feel, <laughs> that feels like a natural evolution. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then my other personality is basically, like, uh, like, basically an elf you know, soft, like, British accent. Like, that's kind of, like, <laughs> my second go-to. And I was like, this feels right for this character. 
you know, high society, royal. It just fit really well into one of my basic characters. Mm -hmm. um, and then Prim um, was a halfling. And it's always fun. Um, she a halfling or a gnome? She well, she was a gnome, but it's uh, more. It has a description of halfling, kind of okay. like in its thought. And again, Tolkien, I was like, seems like a hobbit, and it's really fun as somebody who's really tall, five foot ten, playing somebody who's really tiny and really small. Um, I just love doing. Um, so kind of like a a fun uh, little adventurous thing who was um, uh, I think it was like a um, like a cleric almost yeah I think she was a cleric yeah or a priest something along those lines same thing yeah the priest is a cleric paladin it's a pri uh, priest is a cleric and a paladin basically put together leaning go. a little bit more into paladin than it is yeah yeah I mean, exactly. they have to lean one way or the other sometimes just to get it right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, leaning leaning cleric. Um, and she made it really far. Yeah, um, she did. And then Nibs. Of course, when you think Marionette, you probably think, you know, like Pinocchio. It's the basic thing. And I I've... just needed to make a word. Pick a word that means construct it's without, without good... war in the name. Yes. And it, like the 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 word for marionette is so cool because not only do you you know think of Pinocchio the kind of like the typical marionette but then you get into the thought of uh, kind of more yeah like mannequins who's controlling such marionette like what driving forces are controlling this marionette and so I thought you know this kind of construct is so like could be something very serious and mm -hmm. very like aggressive almost especially being made of stone and i was like you know what i'm gonna go the opposite direction of what's expected of this marionette construct and make them the most like light-hearted like little sweetheart ever um and it, just because it's, it's fun that's interesting all these choices because when we compare it to like the setting it's uh dark. uh it's not as I, i've said it before Aida, it's not a perfect world, but it's on the brink of being a better one. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's a great world. I Thank think it's you. Fascinating. I uh, love it. Yeah, the being marionette, it, you're like you're roughly ten thousand years old. Because you can't be made anymore. Um, so for your choice to make the character to be like gentle sweetheart, the story is. How does the marionette get to that place? Yeah. Exactly. That would be fun to explore a story sometime. See what he does. Maybe I'll fly out there. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I'll be an NPC one of these days. I mean, you just fly out and uh, play D&D &D more often. Who knows? Not that far. <laughs> uh, where can people find you? Where can they go? Specifically. Specifically. Well, my address is... <laughs> Um, uh, so I'm almost exclusively on threads. I am on Instagram because they're connected, but I've left the hellscape that is Twitter a while mm. ago. Um, so it's everywhere. It's Onduin, A-U-N-D-A-W-Y-N, which if that sounds familiar, that's because it is. It's based off of the river Anduin from Lord of the Rings. Um, and I got it professionally, uh, translated by Wizard Way Chris and tattooed on my arm. Oh, wow. So now I've got my name on my body. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so now they can identify you. Now I can be easily identified. Uh, yeah. Amongst the 13 tattoos I have, that'll be the one to identify me by. Yep. Yes. Um, and then, of course, you can find me at Roll D5, R-O-L-E-D-5. On Twitch or YouTube? Yep. Twitch. So Twitch is R-O-L-E underscore D5 because you can't have a space. But everywhere else, it has a space. All right. Yeah. Wanda win? It's fun. This was great. It was great. Thanks. We gotta play more more games together. I agree. <laughs> Let's do it. I would love to.